I read three books of short stories. One of them was all by Alfred Bester. It was called Virtual Unrealities. And then there were two anthologies. There's this one, 17 Times Infinity, edited by Groff Conklin, and Universe 5, edited by our man Terry Carr. I'm gonna give you my top five stories between all three books. 5,271,009 is by Alfred Bester. It was published in 1954. It's a challenging story and not a crowd pleaser. Um, Bester was a part-time science fiction writer and because I think of that part-time status, he had more distance from the form. It, you can just tell that he felt completely at liberty to write whatever it was that he felt like writing. He's best known for writing The Demolished Man and moreover Tiger Tiger or Stars My Destination which is held forth as this proto-cyberpunk masterpiece, one of the seminal novels in the history of science fiction, and it's one of my favorites ever. Not all of his work is of that caliber. There's a lot of stories in here that I thought were kind of filler, and he tended to repeat the same tropes and motifs a lot, but this one is just completely like out of the park weird. It's about a mysterious figure who speaks 10 different languages, often all in the same paragraph, uh, punctuated by exclamations and, and colloquialisms, who's a very wealthy art buyer who takes an interest in an artist and a weird story turns into a completely surreal story that hops through different narratives in which the artist is put through scenarios where all of his deepest dreams and aspirations are fulfilled. It's a really crazy, fast-paced, confusing story that was pretty disorienting while I was reading it. It pays off at the end and it all wraps up in this nutshell of Bester kind of wagging his finger at the reader and the readership with a capital R of science fiction because on top of being this parable about the dangers of wish fulfillment, it's also a satire of science fiction. Bester clearly wrote a bunch of stories in this collection as pot boilers, as a means to an end to get a paycheck, or at least that's how it feels. But there are these peaks of him just kind of fanning out all of his peacock feathers as a writer and just waving them around and they're just so brilliantly iridescent. And this is a great example of that. It takes a lot of mastery as a writer to pull off something that's seemingly so chaotic and at the end to uh, not only carry the reader through the middle section that's very confusing, but to uh, reward them with this big payoff. Uh, where it, there's this tonal shift where it's all madcap and crazy and farcical, and then it gets very, very serious at the end um, as Bester kind of lowers his spectacles and peers at you over them. The second one is also a Bester. It is Adam and No Eve, which was published in 1941. Another example of not only why I seek out older science fiction, but why I lose nothing by seeking out older science fiction, because writing of this quality lasts forever. It's a much more straightforward story than the previous one. I don't remember the actual numeral string. It's about an astronaut who launches himself into space despite the dire warnings of one of his peers and as a consequence of some kind of particle physics thing that happens with the engine, all life on Earth is wiped out. The surface of the planet is rendered into this ashen hellscape and he lands back on Earth and is the sole remaining surviving human. Absolutely amazing Robinson Crusoe kind of a story that's written so evocatively. It reminds me quite a bit of Jack London, which is one of the highest compliments that I can pay to really any piece of writing. The next is The Night Wind by Edgar Pangborn, which is from this one. And I reviewed each of these books individually and reviewed every single short story in each of the books on Patreon, which costs five bucks. You get access to uh, individual review videos as I shoot them for each book that I read. And there's also a pretty sizable back catalog already. The Pangborn story was definitely the standout from Universe 5 because of the beauty of the writing. It's set in the universe of a novel titled Davy, which I have not read, but it's Pangborn's most famous work. Taken at face value, it's a pretty conventional story, and it makes a fairly tired point that I have complained about on this channel already, but because the writing is so beautiful, um, I don't really care. If you like Book of the New Sun, if you like that kind of dark, drippy, atmospheric sort of science fiction writing, I think give at least this story a shot. It's about a kid who lives in this post-apocalyptic, future town that's ruled by religious extremists. He's persecuted and flees into the forest to try to find relief, we will say. 
and he comes upon a wolf who has killed a man. I won't say any more to spoil it because there's not much left of the plot. I just think Pangborn was a couple notches above everybody else in this book in terms of how good the prose was. And that includes Gene Wolfe, actually. Gene Wolfe has a story in here that I didn't really like so much. Short in the Chest by Idris Seabright was published in 1954. And uh, Seabright is one of the pen names of Margaret St. Clair, who's best known for fantasy writing. And she's a pretty much forgotten writer, and I'm not entirely sure why. My first reflex when I read it was to think, I can't believe that this was written in 1954. And I really have to stop feeling that way because I feel that way all the time when I read the really good stuff from this period. It's about a future military composed of four branches that all hate one another and there are high tensions between them. And the state contrives this program um, to try to generate a feeling of conviviality between them where they pair off individuals from each branch for mandatory sexual coupling. And there is a woman in the Marines who's trying to find a way out of uh, this mandate and goes to see a robot psychiatrist called a Huxley in the story. And the robot gives her some uh, surprising, unusual, and potentially dangerous advice. It rules. It's a very short story. Could have been a novel. I absolutely would love to read more from St. Clair or Seabright, or she has some crazy other pen name, Wilton Hazard. And then finally is The Machine Stops by E.M. Forster, originally published in 1909. I've invoked this feeling a few times of this, this vertigo that you get when you look down through the annals of history to a publication date of somebody pulling off this seemingly magical feat of foresight or just authorial flair and I don't think anything in science fiction has given me that feeling more than this story. Forster is definitely most remembered as a mainstream novelist. He is most remembered for Howard's End and A Passage to India, which were a couple of his late novels. And Machine Stops gets mentioned less often than those works, and it doesn't get talked about all that much in science fiction, or uh, at least not on BookTube. I've heard uh, Steve Outlaw Bookseller talk about it uh, as a great important work, which it absolutely is. It's a proto, not even a proto dystopian, it's an arch dystopian science fiction short story. I tried to find an essay online explaining in detail the influence that it had on dystopian literature, and I couldn't really find one. I have to assume that it was just monumental. It does remind me of the time machine a little bit, that may be on purpose because. Forster wrote The Machine Stops as a direct rebuke of a utopian novel that H.G. Wells published in uh, 1905, titled A Modern Utopia, and I haven't read that one. I would like to read it at some point. I would like to make a run of utopian books because nobody talks about them anymore and everybody assumes that they're stupid and unimportant and dangerous, so I'm curious about it. And everything that I have seen dystopian fiction express or the great works, the canon of dystopian works, 1984, Brave New World, books like this. I see a germinal seed of all of that work in Machine Stops, and I think Machine Stops said it succinctly and lucidly and beautifully, and I would argue, I think, more beautifully than the big famous dystopian novels, and that might be a little bit controversial, and I also haven't read those in a long time, so take that with a big asterisk. It's set in this future where everybody has been turned into this kind of bipedal naked mole rat. We don't have hair, we don't really have teeth. Everyone lives inside this massive underground infrastructure that's tightly regulated by uh, an artificial intelligence. And this is called the machine. And the machine provides for all human needs. Everybody is isolated in their own chamber, their own identical bedroom, where they communicate with one another on essentially tablets, these slabs of material that project video and audio. Everybody spends the entirety of their lives underground. Nobody goes to the surface. 
and people dedicate the majority of their time to these sort of frivolous intellectual pursuits of attending lectures about trivia from Earth's history. And eventually someone develops the ambition to escape from the machine to the surface. Every piece of the story is either remarkably prescient, and that is praise that gets thrown around a lot, and it's usually not that impressive, but to capture this feeling or this vision of uh, humanity that is completely dependent upon uh, technology, is completely infantilized by technology and isolated, alienated. Atomized is the popular word for it now. It's not just that Forrester got lucky and predict, like the Star Trek, you know, predicted the cell phone. It's not gimmicky like that. It, it strikes a sort of like moral or spiritual chord that everybody is strumming now. Nobody can shut up about the dangers of cell phones. Uh, this is a point that was made in 1909 and made more lucidly by Forster than most pundits and commentators make it now. It's also just stunningly beautiful. There are certain lines in this that feel like they were pulled out of the Bible. As with any time I love a piece of writing and advocate for it on this level, I have mixed feelings about it because I don't want to set up too high of expectations for you that'll be dashed. But um, this is how I really feel about it. I really think that it's a masterpiece and one of the finest pieces of science fiction that I have ever read, uh, be it short story form or novel form. And I can't really think of a short story that I've read that I think is superior. There are short stories that I just personally like more, but objectively, I think this is probably the best one that I've read. I'm still much more of a neophyte when it comes to short story form than I am with novels. I don't enjoy reading them as much as I enjoy reading novels, um, but it has to be acknowledged that they are of critical importance to the history of both science fiction and fantasy. And there are people who know a lot more about it than I do who have a bigger set of references for it. Uh, Bridger from Library Ladder recently put out a great video about the history of the science fiction anthology. So check that out if you're curious for kind of the bigger picture, which I'm still struggling to get myself. I am going back to novels. I just enjoy them more. Um, but it is good to supplement with the, the short stories because some of them are wonderful. A lot of them are not. A lot of them are very bad and very annoying. Uh, and I talk about those in the other videos. So thanks for watching this one and see you on the next one.